big welcome to uh, to some panelists that we've got here with some great diverse experiences and and achievements between you. So let's start off. What does the theme mean to you? So this the theme this year for International Women's Theme is embraced equity. So let's have a quick chat about what does that mean to you? And we'll start, Melissa, with you. Maybe before we talk about what it means to me, we talk about the difference between equity and equality, because that's really important. As I was trying to teach my nine-year-old girl the difference for this International Women's Day between equity and equality, and it's an important one, right? Equality is where an individual or, or group of people are given the same resources and opportunities, and they're all created equal with the same resources. Whereas equity is a bit different, right? That recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates you know, an exact resource or opportunities that needed to reach an equal outcome. So equity is really what we can all do to ensure we have a more equal workforce or equal community. We need to strive for equal outcomes to women, but actually those differences are part of the superpowers that people have. Some of those things, the diverse backgrounds, the struggle that some people have to get to where they are, that's part of the superpower that they bring. So acknowledging that and then providing the outcomes, providing uh, promoting equality, working towards ongoing measures to address those inequalities that anyone faces, whether they identify themselves as a woman um, now or in the future, it's understanding and, and making sure that we are providing steps to that end. For me, one is not enough. And I see too many organizations and leadership teams who declare success quite early in getting a certain proportion of women to senior leadership roles, but we're only just generating momentum. So I think about this from an equity standpoint, thinking simply one is not enough. The other reflection I had as I was thinking about the difference between the two is flipping it on its head. If you can't flip something on its head, don't say it. Or often do we refer to a working dad as opposed to a working mum. You know, there are a number of kind of language terms that you use day to day for me that just aren't appropriate. And if you can't flip it, then eliminate it from your language. And listening to you all, it, it makes me think I've, I have identical twin daughters and what each one needs are completely different. So as I look at equality versus equity, I'm sure anybody with kids has the same thing where you, know, you get this fair. It's because each of them needs different things to, to be successful as they go through life. So some interesting reflections there, I think, on the theme. If you turn, if we turn our thinking now to, to our own teams, we've all managed teams, I'm sure, for, for many years. How do you empower the women in your team? How do you make sure that they're seen and they're heard and that they have what they need? For me, it's quite basic, active listening. Uh, all too often, we don't listen enough to our teams. And from a kind of leadership standpoint, where I've had the most enjoyable, successful business experiences is where we've had a really strong powerful team and like any uh, team you've got to understand the constituent parts of that team and how to get the best collective strength uh, from an individual so actually understanding each and every person in your team uh, and, and making sure for from a woman's perspective you're tuned in and you're actively listening to what their needs are and how you promote that within the context of the team to reach their goals is absolutely critical making zero assumptions and you know, as you put together teams thinking through from a ground zero, what is it people need to be the best version of themselves and to have the right developmental opportunity? And of course, in a well-balanced team, you've got a number of women who you're thinking about that perspective from, as well as the men who might be on the team. So empowering for me is about active listening and, and of course, acting on it. They say that between six and 12, young girls are heavily impacted with a decline in confidence and the development of this strength and empowerment and the feeling they could do anything at six, but then somehow that begins to decline over the course of our lives. So we've tried to really think about how can we empower girls and women, not just in our teams, but in our lives, so that we fill the world with strong, determined, and incredibly passionate women, and thereby, of course, leading to more women in the boardroom, inevitably. That was the main goal. But let's go back to empowerment. So if we know that young girls lose that sense of confidence and determination, it really has to do with that lack of empowerment. We found that empowerment is best served to women when a couple of things happen. Number one, the environment is safe. They can take risks, they can fail, they can stand back up again, and the women and men around them will support them in their journey. So the empowerment that we want to offer to our women, both on our team here at SUSA, but, but in the tech community, or in fact, anywhere, even for our young girls, that the first step in empowerment is to build confidence and safety. 
I think you raised some great points there, Melissa, and, and things that resonate with me, right? Both in terms of having my own daughters at that great teenage age of 14, um, you know, but also that that element of confidence that, that tends to drop off in, in women. I see it time and time again when I coach women, when I run programs, um, that kind of thing. And, and I think giving them that safe environment and, and pulling men and women in, into the challenge. We, we Mark and I are actually in Sri Lanka at the moment. We held a, a session with some of our women leaders yesterday, which I pulled Mark into. And actually, it was a great session with both of us there. So super important having that support from, from men and women for it. We talked a little bit about that young talent. So, so Melanie, let me ask you, you, you do a lot of work outside of IFS. Do you see that confidence thing happening with the people that you work with? The primary school, the schools are encouraging the, the children to get into, you know, to do STEM projects and they're actively doing those. They're, they're happy, they're learning. Um, there's no self-awareness, there's no peer pressure. They're getting on and doing it. Secondary school age, around the 13, 14, 15 of the GCSE age. Yes, I'm seeing, you know, some girls very committed. I, you know, I've, I've judged robot projects and all sorts of things. They're very motivated, very committed. But then I start to see the drop off. So at 17, 18, university age, I see a significant drop off in the amount of um, women or girls that I see. There's research out there that says that you know, only 1% of girls a year are on university or increasing university STEM courses. And when you're at a basis of only 17 to 19% of women on university STEM courses, that's a huge mountain to climb. Because if you're only increasing that by 1% a year, it's going to take us 20 years to get parity unless we do something to accelerate that. But what advice would you give to those generations that are now coming you know, either straight out of school or out of university or college into the workforce? What advice would you give managers to, to help manage those individuals and help, perhaps help manage more specifically those women that are coming through now? So I was one of those women um, that 10 years ago, I didn't realize I was the only woman in the room. I, I just kind of looked forward and got on with it. And I didn't actually look around to realize that I was often the only woman in the room. Um, you know, ignorance is bliss, perhaps they say. But for me, as a young girl, um, I didn't start in STEM. I started much later in my career getting into technology. There's been a lot of discrimination. And you know, there's a statistic now, they say 50% of women today say that they felt that um, reported gender inequality, discrimination, or sexual harassment. 50% of women in tech, which is which is a huge and alarming statistic. And what that leaves me with is, is a protective gene. It makes me want to coach and lead the young talent and ensure that they understand the environment they work and that they that we all need to support them. You said something that's very, very important, which is it's not about women getting in the room and complaining about the environment that they work in. It's about men and women coming together to really lead our world forward to be more diverse and inclusive. And that's in, including the young talent. They must understand that they play an important role. Uh, they play an important role for the future of our communities, our tech nation, as they say. It's important for them to understand that they are protected, that they are watched over, that they are safe, as we said about earlier, and to ensure that we don't do anything to really harm that load of confidence they have coming in the early part of their career. I actually started my career as a techie and then moved into HR. So perhaps I've gone the uh, the other way, but still with a technology um, company. And, and I agree with you, for the longest time, I didn't think particularly about the fact I was a woman and everybody else was a guy, you know, and then all of a sudden it sort of dawns on you sometimes and you suddenly go, oh, hang on a minute, so many people like me around, you know, where, where is everybody? It's a little bit lonely. Uh, Mel Melanie, you know, you manage a, a technical um, part of the organization in many ways, right? A lot of what you talk about is technical. T talk to us a little bit for, from that standpoint about the women you see kind of coming in and, and how they navigate that technical um, aspect of it. Because sometimes that, that is the piece that is, I don't know, for some reason scary to, to people that they won't understand it. And I think it comes back to that confidence element. Talk to us a little bit about your experiences there or, or your team's experiences. Uh, my own experience is, again, similar to both of you, I've always been in tech, so for 30 years since I left university. And I, again, didn't ever consider, I didn't look around me and think I was the only person in the room that looked like me and sounded like me. And it's actually only been in the last few years that I've realized it is where I've looked like other people at pictures of board members and gone, oh, okay, we've got a problem here. So it's interesting, I, it's just nothing, it's not something that's entered my mind, I just got on and did with it. But 
things have changed now for sure and things are getting harder but what i i have to say the ifs interns i am absolutely blown away by their confidence these you know 20 somethings 19 20 somethings that are coming in that are willing to speak out and they do speak out and that's absolutely fantastic so i think for that age it's less about this confidence it's more about giving the practice and to help them build their credibility i think some, some great observations there right and, and it is that challenge of i think the younger generation coming into the office full of enthusiasm and stuff you know but then something happens right they do get knocked back or they get upset you know somebody upsets them on a phone they don't know how to deal with it and that kind of thing and to mark's point earlier right being brave and asking family and friends and your role models for help how do i navigate that how do i deal with it because what we don't want to see is is that sort of energy and enthusiasm and confidence start to drop off as they go through their career you know, I, I would say you know i'm, I'm perhaps towards the end more of my career now it does come back <laughs> which i think is a good thing maybe it's just because you get to a point where you think, oh, i'm over all of that stuff now i'm not going to worry too much about it but it is important for us to uh, to be careful of our teams and, and be careful of people with it um, i'm going to change tack slightly I, again as i said we, we had a good chat with some of the ladies here in, in sri lanka yesterday and we had some good discussions around why is diversity so important in business you know why are we putting all this focus on it is the right thing to do you know that the world is more or less 50 50 men and women and we don't see that in technology we don't see that in business so i'm going to ask all, all of you we'll start with melissa if it's you melissa as a ceo why is diversity what's the business imperative element of equality and equity and diversity within your business when i think about the importance of diversity and inclusion for me it's to have diversity of, of a voice and diversity of thought people naturally with different backgrounds, different origins, different experiences. And we talk about equity in the first instance, right? The level playing field, we're not on. We don't live in a level playing field, but that inequality or the inequity that we've got, if you will, brings forth different ideas, different ways of thinking, different backgrounds, different experiences. And that's what we need to really be able to operate in a diverse world. So for me, there's loads of statistics real statistics around profitability and the top line, the increased bottom line for businesses that we can all achieve by having a diverse workforce. But it really comes down to the root of being open. I, you know, I run an open source company. Everything that we that we build is free. It's, it's open, developed in, in the community of thousands and thousands of engineers. And it's, it's more than just a way of coding. It's actually the demo, democratization of thought and software that's put together. I think I'd start with a reflection on my own experience, um, and we shared this with a team yesterday, and it's absolutely true. Whenever I've had teams that have been well balanced with men and women, it's always, without fail, been better outcomes. Equally, I think there's a huge talent pool that technology business are missing right now because you know the numbers speak for themselves. Therefore, by definition, you know we're not tapping into the extent of that full talent pool. So the imperative is there for businesses to want to do that, surely. And I think few companies have been able to turn it into an asset all by itself as a destination for young talent, for female talent that perhaps want to pursue their careers uh, with a company. So I think that represents an opportunity for those to get that uh, right. But I'll finish how I started. It's always a better experience when we got more women involved in teams and in leadership. Quite honestly, if we're looking at black and white business benefit, uh, one of the things is at the moment, everyone's concerned about business resilience. And one of the levers that you can uh, pull for business resilience is around workforce and uh, stability around the workforce and we all know that there is a problem with the pipeline of talent in in stem in stem businesses so having that ability to bring in uh, women into the workforce to to help with that pipeline build that skilled work workforce helps with business resilience whereas you know if you look bring it right up to date you think about ai and it's exploded now and if we don't have you know, a diverse workforce working on AI, developing AI, you're going to end up with unethical bias models. And those are the, you know, the things like um, AI are now being brought into recruitment apps. Um, so again, it's going to affect everything we do. Right, I think there's some examples there, right? I, either from a product standpoint or, or Melissa talked about, you know, her customers don't all look the same. And so we need to make sure we've got that diversity of thought and diversity of input. Um, when we do things. I've got one more question and then we'll, we'll bring things to a close. 
it, although it, in some ways it feels like a long time ago, but maybe it wasn't that long ago we were all dealing with COVID. And for, for most of us in technology companies, that meant a lot of people going to work remotely or work from home. What impact do you think that had, that shift for technology people to, to work more from home than perhaps they had before, have that remote? What impact do you think that had? You know, we're talking about embracing equity. What did that do to embracing equity? I would have thought that um, post-COVID, we'd actually see a significant increase in the numbers around gender diversity and technology. In fact, the statistics show us otherwise. We've had the worst downturn and a decline in women in not just leadership roles, but actually in technologies and industry over the last two years. The balance has been unachievable. We haven't been able to recruit more women and get them to stay in, and we haven't been able to promote them. By being at home, whilst it's offered the flexibility, we thought that this would give us the opportunity, but instead it's on the opposite. It's, uh, it's provided a platform for a lot of women that, for example, have not been the ones to raise their hands and be vocal, to be hiding behind a computer screen like what we're doing right now and to be remote, rather than be around people, receive the encouragement and the enthusiasm of your coworkers. We've all now retreated into our home offices. And it's almost zipped up the confidence and buckled down the voice of our women rather than lifting them up. And that's been proven by the statistics, by the decline in women in technology, the decline in women in, in, in leadership roles. I mean, 5% of tech CEOs are women. I mean, 5%. I mean, that's, that's outrageous. And in most industries across the board, the maximum we can find is 10%. And that number has not increased, by the way, even though we talk about it consistently and constantly about the urgency around diversity and inclusion. So I think what we are faced with now is whilst on the one hand, we have huge amounts of flexibility. What that's done is it's closed the door for the collaboration and the in-person and face-to-face -face meetings and enthusiasm and encouragement that our women desperately need to carry on to not just stay in tech, but to begin to climb and continue to climb in their career. We have to be very, very aware that we don't soften the voices of our women and our diverse workforce and taking away the platform for them to be encouraged to stand up and ask for the promotion or apply for a new role or have that camaraderie that's developed when you're in person. So I'm, I'm a bit cautious of the whole working from, from home scenario. Whilst the benefits are strong, the disadvantages have proven to be quite substantial for us. So perhaps there's some message in there for, for women, right? Of, of use the, to use the flexibility, take advantage of it. But don't forget that that in-person, that influencing, that physical environment, it is important. It's common sometimes to arrange home lives around those kind of things. I think people got more comfortable with it with COVID. That was great. But we need to come back to that blend a little bit, I think. I have to say, Melissa, I've never actually thought about it like that. Because thinking about it now, one-on-one, -on -one, absolutely fine on Teams. But now, much more reticent to have a group conversation in the you know in an office or even socially. I think it's a double-edged sword actually now thinking about it because on that side you're absolutely right and I haven't thought about it like that before. On the flip side, what I think I'm also seeing though is people have a greater appreciation of what other people have to go through at home because they're seeing it on the cameras behind them because they're seeing children wandering into the room and you don't think about that when you're at work. So I think it's yeah, it's, it's double-edged sword, certainly. Uh, I do think it's quite isolating, and it comes back a little bit to something I said at the beginning, which is when we're talking in the context of early years, women seeking out coaches and mentors and support, that's just more easy. So I think the answer has got to be in promoting different ways in which we can bring teams together that aren't the classic five days a week in the office mechanism. So it's a kind of hybrid type working philosophy but I do think we need to find ways to promote that because I do think we lose something if people are sat by themselves behind computer screens and I've seen it firsthand this week Kate you mentioned we're in Sri Lanka this week and we're in an office environment that's absolutely humming and I know as a consequence of being here this week I've met at least 20 30 people I might not otherwise have met and it sparked all sorts of conversations and thoughts for me in terms of how I think about my role uh, within IFS, which includes you know, promoting uh, a number of women as well. I think it's a challenge too, isn't it? We, we work in global organisations and so you sort of go, well, everyone I'm working with is in a different country, so what's the point of me going into an office because I can't see them? But I think it's the other people you see in the office that you wouldn't normally 
connect with and it's that human connection that, that we all need that's part of of who we are as, as human beings so so if you had to give um people within ifs a piece of advice of the do one thing that they could do to help embrace equity in the year what would be your one piece of advice the, the one impactful thing that they could do that would uh, would could, could make some change i think help to break down some of the institutional barriers that there are the policies and the practices it's a simple one ask questions and it's incredible to me it's incredible to me noticing how many people don't ask enough questions i spent most of my life trying to fit in with other people around me and i think if i left you with one piece of advice about equality and equity it was that just be your authentic self. And I think I would offer my, my one thing, which, which would be to speak up and speak out. There, there are plenty of people at IFS who will happily lend an ear, listen, help you. So speak up, speak out when you see things that you kind of go, oh, I think we could do that better. Let, let us know, let somebody know, ask for some help with it. So as we come to a close, celebrating and recognizing IWD for 2023, our theme is Embrace Equity. A huge thank you to my esteemed panelists here of Melissa, Melanie and Mark. Thank you so much.